Spinal stenosis. After listening to this lecture, the learner will be familiar with the anatomy of the spine and the related pathophysiology that causes spinal stenosis. Understand how patients with spinal stenosis present. And finally, be familiar with both the operative and non-operative treatments available for spinal stenosis. Here's an overview of what we will be talking about. Considering spinal stenosis is a degenerative process, it is not surprising that its incidence and prevalence increases with age. Also, spinal stenosis tends to affect men more than women. Most patients with spinal stenosis, as it will be defined in another slide, are actually asymptomatic. Let's review spinal anatomy. Recall the spinal canal is bordered anteriorly by the vertebral bodies and posterior ligaments. The posterior border of the spinal canal is made up of the spinal process and the ligamentum flava. The lateral borders are made up of the vertebral laminae and the facet joints. Pathophysiology Spinal stenosis is the condition caused by anything that leads to a narrowing of the spinal canal itself. Normally, the spinal canal ranges from 15 to 23 millimeters wide. Typically, when the canal becomes smaller than 10 millimeters, people usually start to develop symptoms. Sometimes, spinal stenosis is caused by a congenital narrowing, but most of the time it is acquired over time. Degenerative changes are by far the leading cause of spinal stenosis. However, People can also develop spinal canal narrowing following trauma or prior surgery of the spine. So how do these patients present? Well, an important clue to making the diagnosis by your history is by uncovering the signs and symptoms of neurogenic claudication. What do we mean by that? Neurogenic claudication refers to the pain in the buttocks, thigh, or posterior legs that occurs with standing or walking, and most importantly is not due to peripheral vascular disease and we will get to how to distinguish the two in just a bit. Often these symptoms are accompanied by numbness, radicular symptoms, or weakness of the lower extremity. As we alluded to earlier, it is important to be able to distinguish between neurogenic and vascular claudication based on your history. First, neurogenic claudication is worse with any activity that causes straightening of the spinal canal. The two positions that lead to spinal straightening are standing erect and walking down and inclined. Conversely, any activity that causes the patient to bend forward and therefore open up the spinal canal will alleviate the patient's neurogenic symptoms. So when interviewing a patient, you want to be very clear into what activities tend to make the pain better or worse. Vascular claudication is classically made worse by activity and relieved with brief periods of rest. Neurogenic claudication is also made worse by activities like walking upright but is relieved by activities which cause you to bend forward, such as pushing a shopping cart. If the diagnosis is still unclear based on the history, there are some other clues that you can look for on physical exam. First, with neurogenic claudication, the distal pulses will likely be intact in the lower extremities, while in vascular claudication, the pulses are either absent or often diminished. Patients with vascular claudication often display evidence of impaired blood flow, such as skin pallor, nail changes, and decreased hair growth. So besides peripheral vascular disease, what other conditions cause similar signs and symptoms? Well, you should also consider other causes of mechanical back pain, such as a herniated disc, an entrapped nerve, or lumbar spondylolisthesis. In addition, other rare causes such as tumors of the spine should also be considered. Like most conditions in medicine, the most useful tool to help make the diagnosis is the history. As described earlier, along with the history, there are some signs on physical exam that can help with the diagnosis. Plain radiographs of the spine are useful in evaluating suspected spinal stenosis because they can help rule out other similar symptoms. However, MRI is the gold standard of imaging for spinal stenosis. If the diagnosis of spinal stenosis is still in doubt after an MRI, there is some data to suggest that an EMG can be of some use. Treatment. Most pharmacologic treatment for spinal stenosis is aimed at analgesia. 
In some patients, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be of some benefit in terms of pain relief. However, there is really little utility to steroids, either oral or injection, in the treatment of spinal stenosis, as this is ultimately due to mechanical causes and not local inflammation. Therefore, other pharmacologic therapies aimed at improving pain are often tried, including opioid analgesics and neuroleptic medications. There is also data to suggest that physical therapy might be of some benefit. While the data is meager, there is little downside to a trial of physical therapy. Finally, for a large majority of patients, the above measures are not able to adequately control their symptoms, and they are forced to consider surgical management. Surgery for spinal stenosis usually involves two actions. The first is decompression, which involves removing the laminae and or the spinal process in order to relieve the compression. Secondly, the decompression is followed by a fusion where the remaining portions of the vertebral bodies are fused with metal rods to help provide some additional strength. Summary. Spinal stenosis can result from any process that causes narrowing of the spinal canal, but is usually due to degenerative changes. Thus, spinal stenosis is more prevalent in older populations. It is important to recognize the similarities and differences in how neurogenic and vascular claudication present, as the treatment of the two are dramatically different. Finally, the vast majority of treatment is aimed at providing analgesia, but ultimately some people will require surgery to relieve the mechanical cause of the spinal narrowing.